Hey everyone, I'm Aaron, and I lead the research team at Alpen Labs, where we're building Bitcoin's financial system. In this video, we'll talk about the motivations and foundations of Glock, a garbled block, technology that Alpen is building to unlock this. So let's look at four different ways that we can compute on Bitcoin. The first is that we just do the damn computation in Bitcoin script. The second is that we construct a proof that the computation is correct and verify that proof. The third is that we generate a proof of the computation, but we optimistically verify it on chain. And the fourth is that we generate a proof of the computation and then optimistically verify it off chain. Let's look at each of these. So the first approach is to just do the damn computation on Bitcoin. The computation has an input and an output, and the computation determines whether or not the input and output are correct for whatever logic we want to reason about. So let's look at what this actually does. We take the input of our computation and we run it directly through a Bitcoin script. What does the Bitcoin script do? Well, it does whatever the logic tells us we're supposed to do, whatever the computation is that we care about. We include the input and the script on chain and check whether or not the output matches. But there's a few downsides to this approach, one of which is the computation needs to be dead simple. If it's not, the script can't support it or it gets way too large. The second is that size matters. Because we need to include both the input and the script on chain, if the input's large, the transaction's large. And if the computation is complicated, the script is large. We can really quickly hit limitations and get expensive transactions. So this only works for very simple computations and not the kind that Alvin wants to do. So for complex financial transactions, we can't verify the computation in Bitcoin script. Instead, we can generate a proof that the computation is correct and then verify that the proof is correct on chain. So what does that look like? We take the inputs to our computation and we generate the proof. We'll pretend that's a proof. We then take that proof and put it on chain along with the script that checks to see if the proof is correct or not. And then we get a very simple output that lets us condition whether or not our transaction happens or it doesn't happen. So there's some pros and cons to this. One of the pros is that we can have smaller sizes. We still need to include some of our computation input on chain, but the proof can be pretty small size and it has to go on chain too. The downside though, is that the verification script that looks at whether or not the proof is correct can still be quite big. So in practice, this doesn't really work for financial transactions either. So when we talk about proofs, what do they actually need to be able to do? Well, our proofs need to be very small in size because we need to have them appear on chain. They have to be impossible to forge. So you can't trick the system. And they have to be very quick to check. What kind of proofs do we use? In practice, we use ZK snarks. They happen to be zero knowledge too. So we said that for complex financial transactions, we can't verify a full proof of computation on chain. It just doesn't scale. So what can we do? One option, which is used in BitVM1 and BitVM2, among other designs, is to verify a proof on chain, but to only do it optimistically. Let's look at what that means. What that means is that we claim that the uh, computation was correct, and we wait for a challenge. A challenge may or may not happen. A challenge says, I don't think the computation was correct. If I challenge the computation and claim that it's incorrect, then you have to issue a proof. That's our proof that the computation was correct. Now, what do we actually verify? Remember, we said that we can't verify the proof all at once. It just doesn't work. So instead, the technique that, say, BitBM2 does is it actually breaks up the computation into a bunch of smaller chunks. Each of those chunks can be executed on Bitcoin. So now we look at one of these several smaller chunks. If the computation is actually correct, all of the chunks will be correct. But if the computation was in fact wrong, and the challenge is valid, then one of the chunks has to be incorrect. And we can reason about that on chain to get our output. But what if the challenge wasn't issued at all? That means no one claimed that the computation was wrong. In that case, we don't have to put any of this stuff on chain at all. And instead, we can just jump right ahead to the output. There's better scaling here. So this design does work, and Alpin and our partners built it. But why don't we want to use it? There are some downsides, one of which is size. We talked earlier about trying to do a foolproof verification absolutely doesn't work on Bitcoin. The chunks that we talked about here do fit on Bitcoin, but they're still very large and can 
manage to be a significant chunk of a block. Another issue with this is complexity. While we can build out these chunks, it's really tricky to try to build out in Bitcoin script this kind of chunked verifier. A third way that this gets tricky is trying to link the chunks together. There's some complex cryptography and some complex Bitcoin script that goes into that. So overall, not ideal. So we talked about some of the downsides of doing this optimistic on-chain verification, a la BitBM2. So what did Alpin come up with? Well, it's called Glock, a garbled lock. We'll discuss later in detail how this works, but here's one way to do it. So kind of like the previous design, it's optimistic, which means that we wait for a challenge to be issued. If no one challenges the computation, everything goes through just fine, basically nothing goes on chain. But a challenge might arise, claiming that the computation wasn't correct. Somewhat similar to before, we then have to issue a proof that the computation was correct. But we don't directly reference that proof on chain to do any kind of verification. Instead, the challenger issues a counterproof. What's the counterproof? The counterproof is a proof that the original proof was wrong. So think about it like that. Then what we do is we run the counterproof off chain in the cloud somewhere. It could be on any computer you want. The computation is not too complicated. Through a cryptographic primitive called a garbled circuit. That's where the garbling comes in garbled lock or lock. What comes out of that? One of two things. Either a very small secret is revealed or nothing is revealed. That's the output. And why this is really neat is that that secret is what we use on chain to check whether or not the transaction is allowed to happen or not. It's the tiniest script in the world and everything stays really, really small. So why do we like this approach better? Well, there's several reasons. One of which is there's almost no on chain cost for two reasons. One of which is this is optimistic. If a challenge isn't issued, we get to go right to the output and the transaction's unlocked. But even in the challenge case, we're able to get the transactions much smaller because we have to reason about almost nothing on chain. It's just reasoning about one little secret and that's a very tiny script and a very small transaction. There's some other stuff too, but we'll talk about that later. The second thing is how we actually do the computation. In a BitVM2 type design, we do kind of a circuit type uh, computation. Uh, in the BitVM2 design, we sort of do a circuit-based verification, but we have to do it in Bitcoin script. Whereas with a garbled circuit-based design, we can do it in a much cleaner and elegant way that's easier to write, easier to reason about, and easier to audit. That's better for everybody. Another issue that came up with the BitVM1 and BitVM2 designs is cost. When you have to have more data on chain and more complex transaction graphs in order to execute computation, that implies more cost. If we can bring those things down, like we can with Glock, that means lower costs across the board. There's other trade-offs, but one that's important to mention is that a common complaint about BitVM1 and BitVM2 designs was the relative complexity or inelegance of the designs. They're very clever and they work, but those complaints are pretty valid. Glock tends to be a much cleaner and more elegant design. And cryptographers and engineers like that. In the BitVM1 and BitVM2 designs, we're really hampered by having to do things in Bitcoin script. With Glock, we're much more modular and much more flexible. We're not limited by script anymore. We have a much broader design space. And this lets us pull all sorts of interesting tricks cryptographically and for good engineering. So we call this design Glock, which we said stood for garbled Glock. We'll go into more detail about why we call it this and some of the technical details in later videos. But for now, know that each of these words means something important. Garbled means garbled circuit. It's a cryptographic primitive that's been around since the 1980s. And the idea is that we can execute computation and conditionally disclose a secret based on the result of that computation. Interest in this and work on it has exploded very, very recently with regard to Bitcoin. And there's other designs and techniques that are related to this that are happening alongside what Elpin's doing. You may have heard of some of them. One of them being Delbrag, and another being BitBM3. And finally, lock. We know about some kinds of locks in Bitcoin, like hash locks, that condition the release of a transaction on some kind of knowledge of a secret. Well, we don't use hash locks here. We use the secret that comes out of a garbled circuit to unlock our transactions. And this lock lets us deal with almost any computation we want on Bitcoin, something that until very recently could not be done. So that's the high level motivation behind lock. There's a lot more that goes on underneath the hood and a lot more interesting problems that we've had to solve to make it work. 
Let us know below what you think and what you want to know more about. We'll be making more videos that go into detail on some of these problems and the very interesting solutions behind them. Let us know what you want to know more about. Thanks for joining. See you next time.